For thousands of years, as human beings looked up into the sky and dreamed of what was up there, the only instrument we had to gaze upon the stars with was our eyes. Only a speck of human history has been spent with greater instruments, as the invention of the telescope is a mere 400 years old. And with that, a man named Galileo would be the first to discover that a bright star called Jupiter was actually a planet with several moons of its own. Over three centuries, more planets and moons would be discovered in the sky, only seeking to increase the wonder of exploration and discovery, yet remaining only in the works of fiction. It would not be until 1923 that the idea of spaceflight was given serious consideration, and 23 years after that, an astronomer named Lyman Spitzer would finally publish a paper called Astronomical Advantages of an Extraterrestrial Observatory, in which the idea was not only spaceflight, but positioning a telescope into space to get a greater view unimpeded by the refraction of Earth's atmosphere. Even further, a space-based telescope could observe objects in the infrared and ultraviolet, the wavelengths of which are generally absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere, before even reaching the lens of a ground-based telescope. When the age of spaceflight began in the late 1950s, the idea of placing a telescope into orbit was given greater support, as data collecting instruments were already proving invaluable in identifying and cataloging the newly discovered Van Allen radiation belts, as well as giving a more detailed picture of the composition of Earth's upper atmosphere, as well as the solar effects upon it. 1968 would see the first operational orbiting astronomical observatory, OAO-2, successfully reach orbit, and even outperform its intended lifespan several times over, as it collected ultraviolet images of several comets, planets, and galaxies, revolutionizing the art of astronomical study. Within mere months of its operation, NASA had already developed plans for a much larger telescope platform, Whereas OAO-2 only had modest-sized ultraviolet telescopes, this new plan would have a large reflecting telescopic mirror approximately 3 meters in diameter. Such a large and complicated instrument would require not only a large and versatile launch vehicle, but the capability of being serviced and upgraded in orbit, a task that was perfect for the space shuttle, still in concept stages at the time. As OAO-2 continued to display incredible success, the Space Shuttle would receive congressional approval, and by this time, NASA had already created two committees to plan out the engineering and scientific goals of the named Large Space Telescope proposal. This proposal was a particularly exciting one for engineers and scientists alike. Only one obstacle remained to see this project begin. Funding. As the proposal was brought before Congress, the excitement quickly faded, as politicians did not quite see things the same way, and not only refusing to approve the proposed development budget, but even cutting back the budget for its planning stages, as they felt too much time and attention was being spent on the detailed studies NASA was making on potential instruments and hardware. Worse, in 1974, the budget was cut to a further degree, and all telescope project funding was removed. Indeed, numerous NASA projects were rejected as the days of Apollo came to an end. The only thing that was allowed to continue was development on the space shuttle, and even that on the condition that it met requirements for Department of Defense payloads and could be commissioned for national security purposes if needed. A fierce lobbying and letter-writing campaign by the scientific and astronomical community began many of whom meeting with senators and congressmen in person, and many reports published, all emphasizing the importance, in fact need, of a space-based telescopic platform. When Congress finally agreed in 1978, NASA was given only half the budget it originally asked for. There was no choice but to scale the project down. Gone was the additional half-size telescope intended to be a test vehicle for the hardware and systems, the scale of the project was reduced, and the proposed 3-meter mirror was reduced to 2.4 meters. And even that wasn't enough. NASA had no other choice than to seek out their European counterparts at the ESA, who agreed to supply some of the first-generation instruments, supplement the project's funding, 
and provide it solar wings as well as some support staff to help operate it. In exchange for this assistance, ESA would be given a guarantee that European astronomers would get at least 15% of the telescope's observing time. The final budget was granted to NASA, and development began almost immediately, planning for an approximate five-year development cycle, intending to launch in 1983 when the new space shuttle would be in operation. From here, the project was split across several different sources. Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville took primary responsibility for design, development, and construction of the telescope itself. The optics company Perkin Elmer was commissioned to design and build the optical telescope assembly and the telescope's fine guidance sensors. Goddard Space Flight Center took overall control of the scientific instruments, as well as the ground control center for the telescope mission. And finally, Lockheed would design and develop the spacecraft in which the telescope would be mounted into and integrate the two together. Indeed, Lockheed's job was a major engineering challenge. They had some experience with the Agena target vehicle during Project Gemini, in which they would develop a craft intended to work with another craft of another contractor. But this was far more sensitive equipment, operating continuously in harsh extremes of space. While most craft would shield themselves from direct sun exposure, this telescope would be expected to function in prolonged periods of direct contact, and occasionally even observe the sun itself. But their efforts weren't nearly as problematic as Perkin Elmer's, as the optical assembly began to fall behind schedule and over budget, to the point where NASA began questioning the company's managerial structure. As the expected completion time in 1981 slipped by, NASA had no choice but to push the intended launch date back into 1984. In an effort to save costs, NASA ordered a halt on development of the backup mirror, and even as the main mirror was completed, doubts remained about Perkin Elmer's competence, as the assembly itself continued to slip further behind schedule and at a continuously inflating budget. NASA ordered another launch delay, now reaching mid-1985. Lockheed wasn't spared from the budget inflation, as the containment vehicle fell into troubled developments as well, pushing 30% over budget and three months behind schedule, but this was nothing compared to Perkin Elmer. Each quarter, they fell another month behind schedule, and some occasions even complete schedule pushbacks of a day per each day of work. NASA's frustration was reaching the boiling point as the launch date finally got pushed again to spring of 1986 and then to the fall, their total budget pushing over a billion dollars. But it seemed the delays were finally at an end. Construction and installation was back on track, and this large telescopic device would receive a name dedicated to the astronomer who made the breakthrough discovery that the universe was indeed expanding his name would forever be immortalized with the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble was placed into flight rotation and expected to launch aboard the Space Shuttle Atlantis in planned mission STS-61J, which would see NASA's most experienced astronaut, John Young, veteran of two Gemini flights, two Apollo flights, and two shuttle flights, as its commander. The planned launch date of October was even given some headway allowing Hubble to possibly fly as early as August. Things were starting to look up until one devastating event brought the entire space program to a screeching halt. That fateful morning in January 1986, in which seven astronauts lost their lives aboard the space shuttle Challenger. It would take nearly two and a half years before the shuttle could fly again. Hubble itself had to be stored in the clean room and kept powered up and purged with nitrogen, awaiting an opportunity for flight and deployment. And all this cost even further inflations to its budget, as this storage cost nearly $6 million per month to maintain. Though this did give engineers a chance to further test and develop its hardware, replacing a battery that had proven prone to failure, and developing the ground control software that wouldn't have been ready by 1986 anyway, by the time the shuttle resumed operation in 1988, Hubble wouldn't fit back into rotation until 1990, and its costs skyrocketed. 
having began from an original total estimated cost of 400 million, finally reaching an overwhelming 2.5 billion by the time of deployment, over 500% its initial plan. Is it any wonder NASA likes to overestimate its budget proposals? Finally, the delays were over. The pushbacks were at an end. And the telescope that took everything NASA could muster just to authorize now sat in the payload bay of the Space Shuttle Discovery, set for mission STS-31, and ready for launch on April 24, 1990. John Young, unfortunately, would not make his seventh flight as he was reassigned to an administrative position two years earlier. Even so, its five-person crew consisted entirely of spaceflight veterans, every one of whom having flown a space shuttle before. And this was no ordinary shuttle mission. For Hubble to function properly on its mission, it needed to be at a significant altitude to avoid the atmospheric effects from below, not only with regards to orbital degradation, but interference with its optics. The problem, the shuttle was essentially at its core a glorified freight truck and only capable of reaching so high. In this, Discovery would set a record as she reached 600 kilometers, 370 miles above the surface of the Earth. Discovery opened her payload bay and the pricey vehicle was revealed tucked inside. With the help of the Canadarm remote manipulator system, Hubble was pulled free of its berth and was prepared for deployment. But before she could let go, ground control signaled for its solar arrays to deploy, one of which refused to properly unfold. Ground controllers scrambled for a way to re-trigger deployment remotely. Meanwhile, Bruce McCandless and Kathy Sullivan suited up in the airlock and prepared for an emergency EVA to physically pull the panels open if necessary. The two waited in the partially decompressed airlock for almost two and a half hours, ready to go at a moment's notice, until finally, NASA's final command had worked, and the panel finally fully unreeled on its own. There was little time left before the deployment window approached, and finally, the space telescope was released to operate on its own, slowly drifting away from its shuttle orbiter, peaked at the very edge of its operational limits. The remainder of the mission would focus primarily on Earth observations, as many geologic photography experiments can only be done at this altitude. But also, a pair of IMAX cameras were brought on board to film portions of a documentary called Destiny in Space, finally released in 1994, narrated by the legendary Leonard Nimoy. From this high altitude, Discovery would nearly completely exhaust its propellant, as it required a nearly five minute long deorbit burn to return to Earth leaving few, if any, options if the burn could not be completed. Still, the mission was a success, and the crew returned to Earth safely, leaving in orbit one of the biggest pieces of NASA's legacy for decades to come. Hubble itself would make history in many ways, from its troubled beginnings, as a flaw in its mirror resulted in blurred images, and a reputation of failure and embarrassment across the country, to its eventual repair in one of the greatest engineering accomplishments in manned spaceflight and some of the most exquisite images ever captured on film. Hubble remains in useful operation to this very day, expected to remain in orbit as far as the mid to late 2030s, even as its eventual successor takes over its duties. There is so much to Hubble, what it has accomplished and what it has meant to astronomy as well as NASA. But those are stories for another time, as the effort to fix its flawed mirror was a great adventure in itself. Look forward to that story in December as we follow the shuttle Endeavour in mission STS-61. For now, we celebrate the incredible accomplishment of putting into orbit the most famous, versatile, and in fact expensive space telescopic observatory of the century, its trials, tribulations, and triumphs all shaping its incredible legacy a legacy that began this week in space history.